Muhammad Yunus and of course Kala Satyarthi and I would like to quote each one of them um, for leaving us very inspired not just through their work over the last few years and decades but also in what they said um, at the session on Monday on Tuesday. Um, when asked a question Professor Yunus said that if you're on the same road the destination doesn't change and right now the roads lead to extinction and I don't know if that doesn't inspire each one of us on how we act and how we respond to the challenges that each one of us individually and collectively face um, I'm not sure what would. Mr. Kailash Satyarthi on the other hand uh, gently reminded us for where we are uh, gathering today. Uh, for those of you joining us from India, uh, Sankalp or CF country, which is part of the Sankalp Global Summit. Sankalp in Hindi means resolve. And it's a very good reminder to each one of us as leaders, as brands, as manufacturers, as innovators, as NGOs, as activists. Um, or even as uh, ecosystem enablers that we need to have a very clear resolve on how we want to influence outcomes that are beneficial to both the planet and the people. CAIF, like I said, has been born with a very clear and a singular purpose of helping build a planet and people positive fashion industry across the global south. Um, the CAIF Conclave, is a platform that has been uh, running for about three years and it is your platform. Um, is one where we're looking to inform and shape our collective agenda and narrative on how we can help realize this planet and people positive fashion industry. CF has been seeded within and by IntelliCap. Um, and we've had the pleasure of having Aditya Birla Fashion and Retail and the Dune Foundation as our anchor partners right from day one. And what phenomenal partners they've been with us every single day over the last four years. Without further delay, allow me to welcome Dr. Naresh Tyagi, Chief Sustainability Officer of Aditya Birla, but also the Chair of CIF's Governance Council. And Freya Vermeer, who's a Program Manager at the Dune Foundation representing uh, the Governance Council. So, Naresh and Freya, if I could request you to unmute yourself, video and audio-wise, and join me on the stage, please. Naresh and Freya, thank you so much for joining in, and such a pleasure to have you. Um, Naresh, you, I'll hand over the floor to you. Um, please do the honors. Thank you, Ankit. Uh, what a wonderful context you have set. I think last uh, two days, this uh, Sankal, it was really inspiring to hear all these uh, great uh, leaders. With that, good morning to all participants and patrons who are joining us today from textile and apparel value chain across South Asia, Southeast Asia, Africa, Europe, and other part of globe. Officially welcome to CAF Conclave 21 and the opening plenary. As you know, CAF Circular Apparel Innovation Factory, it's an industry-led platform with a mission to build the ecosystem and capability to accelerate the transition of apparel and textile industry towards circularity. As every year, CAF Conclave opening plenary set the theme for the year ahead. This year, the overarching theme is sustainable fashion is good fashion. And this is that app theme given the challenge of natural disaster, pandemic outbreak and economic slowdown, which we have seen in that industry and geography. Textile and apparel has been one of the hardest hit sector with the unforeseen circumstances that has forced business to close under uh, national strategies, mitigate the impact, particularly on people and geography and as well as business. With the, this rapidly dynamic landscape, it is imperative 
business to redesign a strategy and institutionalize system that are resilient, robust, and transparent. Actually, this strategy definitely will assist in embracing new normal, what we all have seen, and further integrating and strengthening sustainability and ESG across the value chain. In last one decade, sustainability has evolved from being a mere response to social and environment crisis as a value enabler, and not only value enabler, but future-proofing the business, future-proofing the ecosystem. Today, we see sustainability as a business enabler that all stakeholders not only expect, but they respect and value it. The growing significance of ESG index and rating in businesses is also, uh, we are seeing trajectory towards sustainability businesses, good business. Uh, when it comes to ABFRN, sustainability is always guiding principle for us. And uh, we kind of take all strategy and uh, operation, how we make sustainability as a core of ability to sustain in short term and long term. And uh, that is not only our ability to survive, but thrive in face of uh, mega trend, all the challenge, time, with the objective to build a sustainable business, which is ethical, equitable, and environmentally conscious. As uh, CAF 2018 onward, we as a anchor partner, we feel happy that CAF is uh, not only torch bearing the industry for circular and sustainable fashion, but it's building an industry level platform for circular textile ecosystem. And this is truly partnership, which demonstrate commitment of ABFRL, Dawn Foundation, Aviscar, and other industry partner to shift the Indian apparel industry from current model of linear towards circular one. The two key area of our partnership in this post-COVID, which I feel is very, very critical, and CAF is one of that uh, platform to enable that uh, more. One is that how we safeguard our supply chain and partners to make whole business and system, which is not only sustainable, but inclusive and build on that uh, uh, innovative uh, and collaborative approach. Second, we feel that there are many challenges which we have seen uh, within our company, within our industry and country. How we take that challenge and uh, involve innovator and R&D institute uh, to address these as a collaborative. For example, uh, last year we find that uh, uh, there is something we need to do for removing plastic. And we launched a program called Better Than Plastic with CAF. Happy to say that uh, this not only give us a scope where 2021 20, innovator came together and share their solution, but we were able to pilot and see some of the uh, good innovation, which is true solution for our uh, plastic challenge. So with the, all these uh, ecosystem and uh, uh, all that partnership, uh, I'm very sure that uh, CAF what we have been doing for the industry, for the geography. It's a, not only enabling uh, ecosystem, but it is helping business to transition towards a sustainable way of uh, uh, more resource based to resource optimized based uh, philosophy. And uh, we at ABFR also feel that uh, our journey and association with the CAF is helping us not to only do product-centric approach, but to create some sort of uh, ecosystem for entire value chain. Uh, now, as the product is core of everything and uh, it revolve around uh, all business model and sustainability strategy, I think it is very important not only to look how we use material and resource better, but what are the way to even look product life cycle, look some of the upstream and downstream, how to design the product, 
how to source the product, how to use the product, how we have that whole customer centricity, logistic, uh, transportation, how to engage consumer for cre creating something for recycling, reuse within the system as well as in ecosystem. I think these approach uh, which CAF is building in last three years is taking good shape now. And uh, uh, this is not only that uh, one organization or one individual, I say it is a collaboration with all stakeholders, uh, all big corporate, all that uh, consumer, customer, vendor, supplier, NGO, even regulatory, so how, investor, R&D issue. So how we bring all these uh, stakeholders together to create a change and to look some sort of change management for transiting linear system of business model in fashion uh, to circular and sustainable business model. Uh, I conclude by saying collaboration and co-creation shall act as a vital pillar across the ecosystem to share both risk and reward in the journey of accelerating sustainable fashion. I hope all participants shall enjoy listening to great uh, voice and impactful uh, speakers that not only shape narrative, focus on global, but it will give a lot of scope for region, South Asia, uh, South uh, Far East Asia, as well as Africa, where we see that uh, whole model of recycle, reuse, and circularity is very, very critical. Uh, I hereby now take privilege to declare that third edition of CAF Conclave 2021 is now open. Thank you all and over to you, Venkat. Naresh, thank you so much. And uh, as always being very articulate and on point on what is it required from each one of us as individuals and as an ecosystem uh, to make an impact that doesn't just work for the businesses, but also delivers positive outcomes for both the planet and the people. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Naresh. Uh, pleasure to have you. Uh, and with that, uh, Freya, may I pass on the floor to you? Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Fankat. Thank you, uh, Dr. Naresh. A warm welcome to participants in the call. I'm pleased to be in this session as an anchor partner of CIF. Um, my name is Freya Vermeer, program manager at the Dune Foundation. Dune has been set up 30 years ago by the Dutch charity lotteries to support innovative initiatives that contribute towards a more creative, social and sustainable society. We believe that innovative initiatives entrepreneurs are the game changers and can bring idealism into practice. These initiatives are innovative, scalable and Dune can be um, as a catalytic funder to these initiatives. Within the sustainable and green portfolio of Dune, we focus on pioneers that work on transition towards access to sustainable energy, sustainable food systems, and last but not least, circular entrepreneurship, which is a very, very important subject at the moment. As we all know, the concept of circular economy becomes more and more known, also in the Netherlands, but also, well, everywhere in the world. However, there's still a lack of concrete examples. And therefore, we believe in the strength of entrepreneurs, innovators that can make the change. One of our focus areas within circular entrepreneurship is circular apparel and the textiles sector. Um, well, it was already said before, and we're all aware of the negative impact on the planet of the industry. Um, and also um, what we actually should do and what our responsibility is as all stakeholders in this sector. Therefore, innovation is needed. Um, and it was already said before, of course, COVID had a huge impact, but also on actually supporting innovation, which is much needed. Therefore, also from a funders community perspective, patient capital is needed. We really need to still take the responsibility to create innovation, the space for innovation. And therefore, um, we also continue to support several initiatives that we have been doing the last years because we see we are also needed as a funder 
to make the circular solutions bring into practice and actually to achieve the system change. Then CIF is one of um, our partners that we um, have supported over the last three years. It's for us a very important example of an ecosystem player, especially also in the region. And we also see that they have a particular role in accelerating the transition towards a more circular economy by working closely with all stakeholders in the supply chain. There's, therefore, we are also very pleased that we recently provided additional support to the next phase of CIF to work towards concrete business cases that are so relevant and hopefully also show the incentives for the sector to adopt the circular practices. CIF and ACE takes, take away the barriers. They create the room to experiment and to stimulate the cooperation with startups, brands and manufacturers. They create the right level of playing field to further support the transition. And that is why we are so proud and also to continue our partnership in the future. It's just a great effort to build uh, as a platform being built on entrepreneurship and innovation at its core. Um, and we also see then therefore also for the future and we also hope that more and more stakeholders will be involved in, ACE, in the ACE project. And then also a request to really set high ambitions, high targets, because the responsibility we have for the future is huge. We really need to create a circular apparel and textile sector based on ecological restoration to really take care of our planet for the future. Um, and this is also the way to say, uh, again, I hope everyone have, will have a good session today and uh, also to officially open this session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Freya. Um, Naresh and Freya both. Um, never hurts to say it again and again, but uh, we owe a lot of gratefulness and thankfulness for you both as individuals, but also the organizations that you represent for uh, standing with who we are and what we do. Um, and I think it would be an understatement to say that we wouldn't be here and evolving the way we are without your support. So thank you so much for asking us the right questions over the last three years. Thank you for keeping us honest in our endeavors to deliver on the purpose that we set for ourselves. Um, and uh, appreciate both of you making the time today. Lovely. Now, um, as, as both Freya and uh, Naresh were mentioning, um, I think it's very evident and extremely clear the uh, negative impact that the fashion industry or the textiles and apparel industry has had um, across the world and on the planet. Now, um, I wouldn't believe the point on the numbers that speak to the impact that we have in a not so humbling way. But at the same time, would love to talk about the need for ecosystem building, the, one, the ambitious mission that we've set for ourselves at CAIF. Now, through the day, um, the focus, the theme for today and the focus for today's sessions is how sustainable business is good business. Now, there are a couple of reasons why we set that theme for ourselves and for all of you. One is that given the global knock-on effects the COVID pandemic has had across the value chain and the impact that it's had on businesses, individuals, communities, um, and the sector, um, we recognize that while there has been a growing narrative around uh, how we need to build back better. It needs to be a good reminder for all of us that our sights on building back better in a post COVID world cannot be limited to the next 12 to 18 months for business revival. We in fact need to shift our sights to a far larger crisis, which um, as we all know, probably causes existential challenges for each one of us. I'm talking about the climate crisis. So for us to move on, for us to shape and inform the agenda on sustainability within the industry, for us to accelerate efforts towards circularity as a pathway to achieve sustainability as businesses, as organizations, as industry, as a planet, it's supremely critical 
that we set our sights on the climate crisis and work backwards. But when we think of the climate crisis, clearly we can't be just thinking from the ecological point of view, because we obviously need to think of the people who are severely impacted already by the climate crisis as it's unfolding. When we at CIF talk about building the ecosystem and the capabilities, we believe that there is a need for a platform and an initiative that needs to go above and beyond any single organization's efforts, resources, and motives to lay the foundation, keeping two things in mind. One is that every single thought and action from CIF works towards ensuring that circularity is within reach for any of the stakeholders across the value chain. Second thing that we constantly ask ourselves every day is by building an ecosystem, by putting the mechanisms in place, by building the partnerships and putting those uh, um, efforts in place, how do we de-risk the participation and make it easier for any stakeholder to actively participate in and also invest in a circular economy. Now, when we talk about sustainable businesses, good business, there are obviously three dimensions that are supremely critical for us. First is how the business and what we do as a business, irrespective of what role we play across the value chain, the impact that it has on the planet. So towards the end of the day, we will have a session that's focused on how do we get to net zero and the role that the private sector can play. And one of the things that we will focus on there uh, is a slight shift from what we've been doing at CIF Conclave over the last couple of years, is that we're actually bringing in a cross-sectoral perspective on how the private sector can actually help make progress towards net zero emissions. We will have participants from not just the textile sector or the apparel sector, with speakers from Shahi Exports, Mass Holdings in Sri Lanka, Unido, but we will also have speakers and representatives from Unilever. The second dimension that's really important when we think of building sustainable business is of course the business case or the economics of a circular economy or a sustainable business. In the second session through the day, we actually focus on exactly that is how do we build the business case for a circular economy? And the reason why we focus on that is because one of the most often quoted reasons or excuses for not testing, implementing, adopting, or scaling circular economy solutions or processes or business models is the lack of a use case or the lack of a business case for any of those solutions. We actually have a stellar lineup of speakers practitioners who are putting such circular solutions and business models in place. And they will speak from evidence of how circular economy actually offers a very smart way for businesses to evolve and stay relevant in the future. The third aspect, which of course, as we've been uh, emphasizing, is that while the dominant narrative globally over the last few years um, around circular economy tends to overemphasize the economics and the, uh, the ecological impact of businesses, which are of course important. But the one thing that we at CIF believe has been underemphasized and needs a good amount of attention as well is the social impact of doing business, the human cost of doing business. So we have a session that's actually going to kick off the CIF conclave, which focuses on how do we reimagine jobs and livelihoods um, and secure the future of work and workers who played a significant role um, across the value chain without being recognized for the value they add and without the security of knowing how their jobs and lives would play out in the next few years. On that note, um, one of the things that we've been uh, doing um, across these three dimensions is early this year, we launched a program, as Freya was alluding to a little earlier, we launched Project ACE, ACE standing for Accelerating Circular Economy. And under Project ACE, we've committed ourselves that by May 2023, less than two years from now, 
we will actually establish the economics and evidence of how different circular solutions and innovations can add value to a business. We're very happy to say that we've signed up three MOUs with three organizations, brands, manufacturers, and alike. But one of the salient features that I'd love to highlight here is that as part of the pilots that we are designing with these three organizations and more that are in conversations, each of these pilots, of course, has a very specific outcome that we want to deliver on. But each one of these pilots is also a multi-stakeholder pilot. And what I mean by that is that it's not just a solution or an innovator or a solution provider partnering with one single brand or manufacturer, but each of the brands and the manufacturers are also bringing in their supply chain partners within their tier one supply chain. Over the last month and a half, we're very proud to say that we've actually showcased innovations to at least 50 to 60 tier one supply chain partners across each one of these brands and manufacturers. And together, over the next few weeks, we are launching the pilots ranging from topics on energy, delivering energy efficiency, delivering water efficiency, alternative materials, and other innovations as well. And you will hear from us as we make progress on each one of them. The second project that we've unofficially launched or we started working on a couple of weeks back, but I'm delighted that we have two partners and we would like to invite Vivek Singh from the IKEA Foundation and Anki from OnView to join me on the stage. Hi, Venkat. Hi. Hi, Vivek. Hi, Anki. Can you hear us? Yes. Yes, yes. Lovely. First of all, thank you so much, both of you, for uh, joining in. Um, and uh, of course, over the last year, we've been speaking a lot about how we can influence both planet and people positive outcomes. And uh, one of the things that uh, kind of brought us together is the shared purpose and the value of building an ecosystem that works for the people, but also delivers planet positive outcomes. So without further ado, uh, Vivek, may I invite you to make the announcement that we are here for? Thank you, Venkat, and thank you, Anki. I think it's a real uh, a privilege and uh, very happy to be here in this conclave today and in this plenary uh, session. And also, it's um, a very, very, uh, I mean, we are very happy to uh, not only ink and announce this uh, partnership in this conclave today, but to get rolling on it. Uh, let me just begin by uh, briefly uh, introducing the IKEA Foundation. Uh, the IKEA Foundation, we are an independent philanthropy, and uh, we focus on uh, creating better and uh, brighter lives on a livable planet through our grant-making efforts and work that we do across different countries and continents. And uh, today, we are really delighted to kind of, you know, announce this partnership and to, uh, to kind of, you know, get into this joint initiative between NVU and the Circular Apparel Innovation Factory, that is CAIF. Uh, the whole idea behind this partnership is to turn textile waste into a valuable resource by closing the textile waste loop. And this means that, you know, we create ventures that continue to reweave, uh, reuse, and recycle textiles so that they don't reach the landfills. And we know that this is a complex route. There are many challenges and barriers on the way. Therefore, this initiative uh, will adopt a two-pronged approach. So while on one side, it will aim at creating sustainable ventures, on the other hand, it will create and build entrepreneurial capabilities through skills and knowledge. And this we feel will you know, unlock employment opportunities, uh, will improve livelihoods of people working in the sector, and at the same time, taking care of the environmental and planetary resources which is something very critical and we have to move in an urgent mode towards it. Now, what really inspired and motivated us at the IKEA Foundation to join this or to support this initiative is that we strongly believe that uh, the need of the hour 
the need of the sector today is to work through partnerships to identify uh, existing solutions and models, as well as develop new solutions and models that can go to scale because the problem that we are trying to address is at scale. And therefore we need solutions at scale. And that can happen only if we work through partnerships at scale. And we also feel that you know, this initiative will provide opportunities and give us the confidence, all of us, to take this model and its lessons and its learnings, et cetera, to other regions of the world, which can benefit from similar approaches and models uh, related to green, related to uh, inclusive entrepreneurship in the textile waste sector. Now, the IKEA Foundation uh, is, is going to uh, support the first or the seed phase, as we call it, of this five-year project and initiative to be implemented by NBU and CAIF. And uh, just to put some numbers as outcomes, uh, by the end of five years, we are looking that this initiative and project would have set up about five to six scaled up ventures. It would have created uh, over 5,000 employment opportunities and some 20 million kilograms of textile waste uh, would have been prevented from entering the landfills. And this is an ambition through which we are moving ahead. But we are also very confident that there will be a far bigger multiplier effect beyond these numbers. So on behalf of the IKEA Foundation, I, I must say that we are really humbled that we are seeding this partnership with NBU and CEIF. And we also want to take this opportunity to urge all and other like-minded organizations to come together, to join hands, so that we can make it a truly a partnership at scale initiative, which is the need of the hour. So with that, you know, I would like to thank uh, both Anki and Venkat and to your respective teams at uh, NVU and CAIF. NVU and CAIF. And to our lovely colleagues at IKEA Foundation uh, who have been working with us, uh, Laura, uh, uh, Els, uh, Surani, and Lotika, who have made this partnership happen together with us. So thank you to everyone. Vivek, thank you so much uh, for the lovely words and for uh, articulating what the program uh, aims to achieve. Um, and I think it's been such a pleasure working with uh, you and the team uh, over the past year, in fact, maybe just over a year. Um, Anki, uh, with that, uh, let me hand over the floor to you and uh, would let you speak about the need for building scalable ventures that deliver impact on the ground. Thanks. Thanks, Fenka. Thanks, Vivek. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and thanks for the crowd, which is growing fast, I see. Uh, also, thank you for joining us and uh, for your interest in making this uh, world a better place. For those people that don't know NVU, uh, maybe a brief explanation. Uh, NVU believes uh, our mission is to create an economy that takes care of people and planet. And we do so by building ventures that take care of people and planet. We have done so in the past 14 years in India, in East Africa, in the Netherlands and in Indonesia uh, mainly. Uh, and 80% of our work has to do with circularity. So we introduce plastic waste, uh, we aim to create a circular textile industry, but in East Africa also on food waste. And why ventures? Uh, I think Freya already explained uh, very well in the uh, introduction. Um, ventures can be the front runners. Startups are innovative, they're willing to try, they don't have a large brand risk that big companies often have or big infrastructure. So ventures can move faster and set the example and then have everybody else join for scale. And I think this is a very, very uh, crucial way of changing markets. Of course, ventures are also business. So it's not only grant giving, they have to be sustainable in the end and run by themselves and make the impact grow without the support of others. Said that, I see there's, I saw in the chat, there's many entrepreneurs here in the circular textile space. It is difficult to do it all by yourself. Um, and with our, 
Uh, five years in the circular textile space now, we realized that uh, if we want to move up the chain and work with textile waste and waste workers, we need to partner because it's not only the ventures that make a difference, it's the full ecosystem that makes a difference. And that is why we're so happy that this program is there. IKEA Foundation has a very strategic approach. And in the past year, they've been helping us a lot with what will be your long-term measurements? What will be your evaluation? How can you make sure this is sustainable? And CAF has an ecosystem and has the skills of capacity building and that can also help the future uh, employees, customers, suppliers of the ventures we build. Besides that, it's been a great pleasure working with the talented teams of both organizations. Um, Vivek, you mentioned Elsa Lotica uh, and Laura also. It's been a pleasure, Suhani. And uh, Venkat, your team with Tanushri and Somatish, it's been, a, it's been a pleasure, but it's also been a lot of fun working together. And I really look forward to do this more in the upcoming years. Thank you, Anki. And uh, the feeling's absolutely mutual. Uh, it's been such a pleasure working with uh, you and the team, uh, Marika, Gigi, Partha, uh, Mickey, um, and uh, we can't wait to just kickstart uh, officially on the ground. Um, but very well said, and, and I think what makes sense from a CF point of view uh, is that um, if, for those of you who were with us uh, last year, you would remember we had shared a video which was a culmination of a the considerable amount of research that we did over the past two years in trying to understand the textiles, waste, landscape, and ecosystem. Um, and one of the uh, uh, one of the insights for us um, as an outcome from the research was that uh, the problem of being able to recover and reclaim value from textile waste uh, is not just unique to the global south, but it's also something that's true for even the global north. And in our efforts to divert the textile waste away from the landfills, we believe there is a gap that needs to be filled on two counts. One is a formal and structured mechanisms or systems that allow for responsible collection and also segregation of textile waste. For all of you who've been part of the value chain, of course, you will understand that if you have a textile waste from one single source or one quality or one spec, it's, it's a lot easier. But given that a lot of the pre-consumer textiles waste comes with a lot of different blends, being able to segregate it properly, being able to do it at scale, and being able to provide threshold qualities and quantity of the textile waste that can be fed into the recycling solution that's available in the ecosystem is absolutely paramount. Now, while there are a lot of organizations which do credible work on how they responsibly handle their own textile waste, uh, much of the ecosystem lacks that support where such a collection and segregation system can actually help them to participate actively. And that's what we are attempting to do through this program. Now, that's the ecological impact from the textile waste that leaks into the environment. The other aspect is the millions and millions of workers who are part of the waste ecosystem who for ages have played a very central role in collecting and managing our waste, those who are underserved, illiterate, and caught in a vicious cycle of poverty, and with absolutely no recognition for the work they do. Now, in India alone, there are an estimated one and a half to four million waste workers. And when I refer to waste workers, they're not just a homogeneous set of individuals or communities. We're talking about uh, heterogeneous groups of communities that make up the waste ecosystem. Through the program and in the true sense of building an ecosystem, we want to leverage the green entrepreneurship approach uh, that IKEA Foundation has been driving and leading, build ventures that OnView has been driving to deliver impact at scale and on the ground. But we want to be able to do that by keeping the waste workers front and center of the program, right? Um, Vivek, uh, would love to hear your views now on, you of course lead the employment and entrepreneurship pillar at the IKEA Foundation, and uh, would love for the audiences to hear from you on how the e, &E pillars approach can help harness the full potential of a green entrepreneurship approach, um, but also what does it take to build a circular textiles economy? Yeah, great. Thanks, Venkat. 
Uh, before I just uh, talk about uh, the portfolio where we are promoting green entrepreneurship, let me quickly give a context of the IKEA Foundation's work. And then, you know, that sets the framework. So, you know, at the IKEA Foundation, um, we, we, we have a people and planet uh, strategy and uh, we aim at improving the lives and the livelihoods of people uh, while protecting the planet for future generations. So that's the driver for us. And we believe that, you know, families need both financial stability as well as a healthy environment if they and their children have to thrive. So for us, uh, and as, as, as I'm hearing everyone, uh, both improving livelihoods and protecting the planet are inseparable. And within this, our portfolio is working towards uh, promoting and supporting uh, green entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship that focuses really on improving livelihoods and therefore you know, creating uh, employment opportunities in a way that addresses environmental problems. And the whole idea here is to harness and use the potential of entrepreneurship to turn environmental problems and challenges into sustainable business opportunities that we're talking about and that can contribute to building green and uh, circular inclusive societies as well as economies with people's well-being at the core. I think that is critical because all these conversations we are ha uh, having and we have been kind of into, uh, the whole idea is that we are doing it with people at the core, at the center of all this. And uh, under our portfolio, we, uh, in order to do this, we work through partnerships. And as a foundation, we do that. Uh, we work uh, with a variety of organizations who have uh, a like-minded approach, have a mission to kind of move towards this in this direction. And organizations that focus on young people, organizations that uh, promote and build the capabilities of small and growing businesses, and uh, organizations that are contributing towards building an enabling ecosystem. Uh, because at the end of the day, I mean, if we don't have an enabling ecosystem, all the efforts that we are putting in will really not move the needle. And to move towards a, a circular uh, textile sector and to harness the potential of uh, green entrepreneurs, the full potential of green entrepreneurs, uh, we feel that we all need to kind of prioritize certain things. Uh, like, for example, working together, which I've mentioned working together and all of us have been talking about through strong partnerships at scale. And that takes some time, some effort to build. Then aligning on a common purpose and agenda. Uh, being intentional and conscious in terms of including and working with young people and women in all the work that we do. Then continuing to build the capabilities of people so that they can respond to the emerging opportunities uh, in the green and the circular economy that we want to develop and moving towards through different initiatives, uh, rescaling, upscaling, et cetera. And lastly, I would say that making efforts to create robust evidence and data points to know what is working, what is not working, what are the gaps and how we can plug those, et cetera, et cetera. Which Venkat, you spoke about you know, the evidence creation and uh, the efforts that CAIF is doing. And all this is very much you know, doable and that's what we are uh, working towards through our efforts at the foundation that how do we bring like-minded and other organizations together so that we can join hands and this is very much doable if we do that, if we work together. So that's our approach at the foundation through our portfolio and through all the efforts that we are putting together. Thank you so much, Vivek. Um, Anki, very quickly moving to you, um, would love to hear uh, your perspectives from your experience as on view in the need for nurturing and building these ventures that are so critical in creating that enabling environment that Vivek was alluding to. Yeah, exactly. So uh, if I could take Vivek's story from an entrepreneurial point of view, and being an entrepreneur is already difficult, huh? Uh, because you, it's your own company, you just started, it's peaks and valleys, uh, you, you, know, you don't know where it's ending. But being a circular entrepreneur is twice as difficult because you're also trying to create a new economy. Um, you're trying to work towards something innovative. And then thirdly, if you're trying to be a circular entrepreneur in, uh, and in the developing economy, you're doing three times uh, the difficulty that a regular entrepreneur has. And this is why we have seen, even though the entrepreneur can be very talented, the idea can be great, support is crucial to make this happen. 
think about the partnerships. I mean, we've been talking about the partnerships a lot in the past uh, 10 minutes. Uh, if you have to build these partnerships by yourself, it will take a lot of time away from building your company. So when you're a part of a program, uh, these partnerships might be there already or can be co-developed. If you can work with other ventures that are in that circular chain, together you already create a value chain. You don't have to do it by yourself. This will also speed up scaling. And lastly, still a risk return rewards for impact investors are are not the same in a circular economy than in a regular economy. So you need a network of investors that have that long-term view and that are willing to go that road with you, even though it might be difficult. And um, it is really good within a program or an ecosystem to have a network already available because also if an entrepreneur has to do that by him or herself, it also takes away a lot of time from building and scaling the business. We have seen in the past 14 years that the actual survival rate of circular ventures can increase from around 20% to around 70% when it's part of a program. And um, we've seen this in our, our, our experience and that doubles the impact, more than doubles the impact of what we aim to achieve. Uh, one of the reasons I am very happy with this program. Perfect. Thank you so much, Anki. And uh, very quickly, from our perspective at CIF, uh, I think one of the defining characteristics of this program and this partnership um, um, and something that we've truly co-created and co-developed uh, between the three partners is that we'll actually mobilize access to capital, knowledge, and networks, something that's been um, the uh, driving point of everything we do at IntelliCap. Um, we want to make sure that the, uh, there is an enabling environment which will help all the participants in this textile-based management model uh, to find value for themselves. Uh, we want to be able to create the right market linkages so that the brands, the manufacturers, the startups, the innovators, the circular business models, uh, the waste collectors, the micro enterprises, the ventures that Anki was referring to, all of them are linked and facilitated in a way that it becomes easier for the, the textile-based management model to actually work and work at scale. Um, last but not the least, of course, is that over the course of the five-year program that uh, we've envisioned, as Vivek was uh, mentioning earlier, we want to be able to uh, facilitate access to capital and access to low-cost capital because both the micro-entrepreneurs the ventures, but also perhaps even the brands and the manufacturers will need access to capital to manage this transition towards an ecosystem that works to deliver some very ambitious goals, as Vivek had mentioned early on. Um, with that, uh, Vivek and Anki, as always, a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining in and announcing this partnership. Um, and I can't wait for a time when uh, the world opens and we can meet in person to celebrate the partnership. Exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Vinka. Thank you so much and have a nice day ahead. Thanks. Bye. Fantastic. And uh, we're so excited with this uh, partnership and uh, can't wait for it to go on the ground uh, in the next week. Uh, now, moving on to the next segment, um, as I'd mentioned, the theme for this year's conclave is sustainable business is good business. Um, and we've actually put together uh, three phenomenal speakers, uh, each bringing in their unique perspective on the different dimensions of what sustainable business means. Uh, so if I can invite on stage Bandana Tiwari, Janvi Papriwal, and Ashish Dikshit, please. Hi, Vinka. Hi, Ashish, uh, Bandana and Janvi. Thank you so much for joining in. Such a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very grateful. Brilliant. Um, and uh, Ashish and Janvi, while uh, we are in the office, uh, just so you know, Bandana is calling us from a beach in Bali. Um, <laughs> just setting the record straight. Uh, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for, uh, to all of you for joining in and uh, allow me to do a very quick introduction to all of you and then uh, we'll kickstart the conversation. Uh, let me start with uh, uh, Ashish. Ashish, uh, of course, is the managing director of Aditya Fashion and Retail, 
Um, he's leading one of those globally integrated organizations, which has presence all the way from yarn to retail. Um, and Aditya Birla, as you all know, has been uh, leading the charge on shaping and informing the sustainability agenda across the industry. More importantly for us, uh, Ashu Dikshit, uh, we're honored to have you as uh, an advisor on the advisory committee at CIF. Um, and uh, all the conversations we've had over the last few years and every single input from you uh, has shaped us uh, and how we evolve as an institution. So thank you so much uh, for all your support over the years. Uh, Bandana Tiwari, um, calling in from Bali again, um, is of course a lifestyle journalist and a sustainability activist. She's a TEDx speaker. Um, she's given keynote speeches across the world around co compassionate consumption, sustainability, and spirituality. Uh, she's a regular contributor to the business of fashion and has written on a variety of topics, uh, including LGBTQ representation in fashion. At Vogue, she's been Vogue India. She's been an editor at large for 13 years and been responsible for planning, visualizing, and the ideating fashion features. And she's had a ringside view uh, through her career on the rapidly evolving industry coupled with a signature. Um, amongst other things, she's a special advisor to the Copenhagen Fashion Summit, and she sits on several advisory boards, including Global Fashion Agenda in Stockholm. Uh, Bandana, thank you so much, and a pleasure to have you. Thank you. And thank last you but not me. the least, pleasure. And last but not the least, uh, Janvi Papriwal uh, joins us. She's the Director of Investments at Avishkar. She's an investor, development finance enthusiast, and a champion for entrepreneurship. She's a strong believer in social and environmental impact that can be driven at scale by capital that can make market-led intervention, market interventions through entrepreneurship. As a director of investments at the Avishkar Capital, she's in charge of a portfolio uh, of several funds. <clears throat> and she's played board roles in the invested companies. She also leads sector specific efforts, especially in sustainable agriculture and climate change. Uh, Janvi has been recognized among the top under 40 alternate investment professionals in India in 2021. And uh, she's driven by channelizing her leadership skills and business acumen towards uplifting the low income community. So Janvi, pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for making the time. Lovely. Um, Janvi, um, I want to start the uh, conversation with you. Now, um, of course, as each all, as everyone who has joined in uh, can see, we're bringing in three different perspectives. Janvi coming in from the lens of a capital provider and the role that impact investment or catalytic investments can make in shaping the economy or the uh, building the ecosystem. So Janvi, let me start uh, the proceedings by understanding the investment theses of Avishkar, given that we recognize as a pioneer in the entrepreneurship led approach towards making impact happen at scale. So um, Janvi, over to you. First of all, thanks, Venkat, for giving me the opportunity to talk about Avishkar Capital and our work here. Uh, and it's a fantastic panel, really looking forward to this session. Uh, so talking a little bit about Avishkar Capital, uh, we've been at the forefront of impact investing in India. Uh, we've expanded to Southeast Asia and now even Africa. Uh, we've gone through investment and exit cycles across five funds in India. And now we're on our way towards our sixth India-focused fund. Uh, we've made about 60 investments and about 35 exits within India itself, and uh, we manage more than $400 billion of assets. Um, and talking about our investment thesis, um, so at Avishkar Capital, we make equity investments uh, in entrepreneurs who solve for complex social and environmental problems with a commercial intent. So we ensure that through our investments, low-income communities are impacted, and uh, that gets embedded in the business model of these enterprises. So the impact that we try to generate is um, either direct or indirect. Uh, so when we make a direct impact, uh, the communities that are associated with the business model, uh, such as the suppliers, vendors, uh, employees, they're almost instantaneously and directly impacted by the positive outcomes of the business. And then there are companies where the impact is indirect or more longer term in nature, where the benefits to communities are leveraged over a period of time uh, through a ripple effect of sorts. And this could be impact on the ecosystem, the sector, and the economy at large. 
and uh, since impact is embedded into the businesses that we invest in uh, impact screening evaluation of impact projection of impact kpis they also become a very integral part of our assessment of the business apart from the business metrics and financial viability um and in terms of target sectors and themes uh, we invest in businesses that are at the confluence of entrepreneurial talent and technology which with the right amount of capital uh, can have the potential to solve for these complex social and environmental problems at scale and um, in india given that we have a vast population that continues to be low income and that we have enormous um, environmental challenges and with covid further having pushed lot of <clears throat> development work uh, back into the past Uh, we believe there are several sectors uh, through which uh, impact investments can be directed, such as financial inclusion, food and agriculture, healthcare, education, climate, and circular economy, of course. So, yeah, that's a little bit about us. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. You're on mute. Sorry. Uh, Janvi, thank you so much for that. Um, and Ashish, if I could uh, now come to you. Um, we've obviously been speaking a lot about the role that businesses can play in shaping and informing the sustainability agenda as and as the chief executive of a an organization that's leading the charge across the industry one of the things that we've been discussing about is how the last 18 months of the covid pandemic has brought on a shift in mindset from the businesses um now aditya birla's reearth program of course is very well known would love for the audiences to hear from you on how the covid pandemic is informing the need for and how the sustainable businesses can be built um, and probably an acceleration towards circular economy um, as as leaders and as organizations in the industry thank you venkat um, so um, i think while your question is um, Uh, sort of weighed on the covid impact and what it has done but i would say the journey for large corporations has been a more continuous one there's been a bit of an acceleration and i would say discontinuity in last 18 months but i'll come to that later uh i think for uh for diverse large organization pres with presence across value chain across consumer segments with a portfolio of brands uh we initially struggled to put our arms around this intangible journey of sustainability that we needed to start and we really started off by uh, two extremes one is to give it a name and a purpose which is easy to understand comprehensive mm-hmm. enough is perhaps in its spirit is everlasting and 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 uh, and durable and that's how the reearth came which is the promise to give back more to earth than you take from it it was as simple as that 10 years back we crafted it Uh, in those days we didn't even understand circularity it was not in the realm of thing but we needed something which most people across the organization could hold on to an idea which is enduring and something which could drive most of our decisions uh while that was good uh, for most people they didn't know so what and uh, therefore the next set of actions came around Uh, what can be the tangible set of activities that we could do and we created a whole series of missions in those days and one on water one on energy one on packaging one on uh, uh, waste one on landfill zero landfill and so on and so forth eight nine missions which gave people a sense of could we do the same thing by consuming less every single one of them if you were to look at was primarily targeted at resource efficiency and those were the early days of sustainability that we were building next came something that we at aditya billa group have been doing for a long period of time but i think we got a fairly good view of of giving structure to it which is not just building a resource efficient company or organization or business model but also a responsible and fair uh, organization and how do you translate that and then came a whole series of activities around how do we deal with our vendors what do we expect them to do should we have a code of compliance for ourselves for our vendors our factories our suppliers our own employees and so on and therefore that's the next set of activities which are also in many ways was deeply embedded as being part of the aditya billa group and we didn't really have to reimagine but i think the whole journey gave a structure to something which made organization more responsible 
and I would say more fair in the dealings that, that we wanted to do. Having said that, I think coming back to now your question, uh, uh, you know, as you evolved and the journey of sustainability around the world evolved with frameworks which all large organizations could adopt, uh, clearly there were two things that COVID has sort of resurfaced and brought to the top. One is uh, very obvious, but not often talked about in, 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 in sustainability conferences, but it's an important one and we must always keep in mind, which is uh, the financial sustainability and the economic sustainability of organizations. Organizations are hard for profit, shareholders have expectations and what last 18 months have done, particularly in our industry. And then I'll talk a little bit about uh, the impact across the textile value chain, but the whole industry, which employs close to 45 to 50 million people, if you look at the value chain in India, uh, the garmenting itself is close to 10 million people. And this is uh, perhaps the direct employment that could be additional to a bunch of people. When the consumption stopped, retail shops shut, shut factories shut across the country, the number of people from organizations, small to mid to including large organizations, which suffered the impact of it and really brought to fore the ability to create an environment in which the organizations, whether they're big or small, find a model and continuously focus on financial stability. I won't take more time than that, but I just want to highlight that it has had a devastating impact on, on the industry across. Uh, and I, I guess that must be the case in the world, but definitely in India, as I as I see a lot of players uh, in the textile value chain. One second point that came to the fore, and I think this, this most organization have always talked about, but I think it hit you harder than ever before in, in the history of corporations over the last 50, 70 years. Uh, and that's not been a very long time since corporations came to being, uh, which is the power of uh, the impact this whole process has had on people their safety, their family is getting affected. Suddenly organizations moved from being uh, anonymous uh, creatures which don't have a soul and a face to really a bunch of human beings who are putting together and working with each other. And that came to the fore in remarkable manners. I think the human spirit, the resilience, in my own organization, we, we, we employ close to 25,000 people in front end of retail. We have close to 15,000 people who directly work for us in our factories. And suddenly for a long period of time, these 40,000 people had no place to go. Uh, uh, shops were shut, factories were shut. And then we saw while India was battling through the resilience, uh, through the COVID, the resilience of a large number of factory workers who came back and, and made PPE kits, made masks, made, made, made products that they were never sort of engineered to do. And what point of time, uh, Venkat, we were making close to 10% of India's need uh, by young women who had taken risk, got out of their home when all of us and the whole country were sitting inside, going to factory every day, figuring out how to make a product which they had never made, changing machines, and remarkable. So I, I would say that's the other aspect uh, of sustainable organization that, uh, that sort of brought forward. Uh, during this COVID period. Uh, what has also happened over the journey of sustainability for us is uh, obviously as you go forward, the frameworks uh, come in, which allows you to do a structured uh, journey and therefore the whole journey around environmental sustainability on from product, from raw material to the supply chain to manufacturing process. And increasingly now to the end of the use, which is where the circularity actually is beginning to come in has started to take a much larger shape and far greater importance simply because I think both consumers and employees are a lot more sensitive to, to the idea and, and more sort of involved in it. How much of that will remain? How much of this, this battle between conspicuous consumption and responsible uh, sort of consumption is something that we'll have to see how the human societies have perhaps experienced one of the deepest uh, disruption at this time, but we'll have to see how uh, our psychs shape as we come out of it over the next few years and few months. But I'm very hopeful that I think both as consumers, as manufacturers, as, as, as corporations, 
uh, and as employees, I think we are far more conscious of, of the world that we are living in, the world that we are creating in. Uh, so I would stop with that. I think there's a whole set of societal and governance uh, structures which, uh, which large organizations are benefiting from as they take the journey from sustainability. But uh, I think this, this, uh, this really has been a fairly transformative period uh, in more ways than one for most, most of us. Um, Ashish, uh, very well uh, made points and uh, thank you so much for that. Um, we've of course, as CIF, <coughs> we've had a ringside view of uh, how ABFRL a team all the way from you to uh, the rest of the business teams that we've had an opportunity to work with, how you're shaping uh, the agenda. But I think more importantly, you speak about creating that enduring identity and that kind of What I loved, and uh, we've always heard this, but uh, never hurts to hear it again and again as, uh, as a leader of an organization, the emphasis that you put both on the planetary outcomes as well as the people outcomes and how, um, especially in the, or the, through the COVID pandemic, um, the acceleration towards focusing on what it means as a business to support the people who are such an integral part of our business and the value chain. So thank you so much for that. And I think that's a fantastic segue for, uh, to bring in Bandana. Uh, Bandana, of course, um, you know, you speak a lot about, um, as an activist for sustainable fashion, you speak a lot about mindfulness in fashion, right? Uh, we've obviously seen a lot of shifts across the ecosystem from investments to farm to fabric business models. We're obviously seeing a lot bigger and better appetite from different stakeholders across the value chain in amping up their sustainability agenda and making progress um, as well. Um, what we would love to hear from you is if we had to envision individual action, what would those changes be? What would those actions be? And these could be individuals as creators or producers or even leaders for that matter. Um, and would love to see if you can bring in from the lens of the mindfulness in the fashion industry. Of course. First of all, thank you. I am really humbled because, you know, with Janvi and Ashish, I'm like, I'm just a tiny little voice from the media world uh, who gets punished for being a fashionista because that's apparently, that's all we do. I just measure the size of our heels. Um, I pivoted from Vogue, uh, which I very much loved working in for 13 years because I am Indian and we all know the bipolarity of our country and it became a little tiresome not to address uh, issues of sustainability. Um, so where I come from and what I try to contribute in my very small, humble way in this sustainability dialogue is about personal change, personal responsibility, ownership, uh, because it is your own wallet that you're using. So I go to Gandhi because, you know, every kind of civil disobedience movement, any kind of personal ownership over a very big social, political, um, impactful uh, event that happened came from a change in heart. And so for, for me, because I'm a writer, um, I always talk about, I'm always, always asked by young designers, um, consumers that, you know, they say uh, being sustainable is so um, uh, expensive that it, uh, they don't know what to do, how, to, how are they gonna do their business when it's so expensive? And in my opinion, I tell them very truthfully, the idea of unaffordability is it's only because we've fallen prey to a very ill-imagined definition of affordability. Because in our dictionaries, which are pretty much defined by the Western world, um, we are taught that cost, value, price, they all mean the same thing. And for instance, like, you know, the price can, as you all know, because you guys are the economists and the business people, I'm not, I'm a simple writer. But I also know, and I try to tell people that the price can fluctuate because we live in a very volatile market and, you know, but the value, the fundamental value of things is not changeable. And so no matter how the economies go, whether they're going to swell or they're going to swallow us, the price of a sustainably made jacket, say, may vary um, when more of it floods into the market because of the demand for sustainable goods. But the value of that product, despite the fluctuations, is always going to be associated with the values, will be associated with the ethics of ahimsa, of nonviolence to the people 
and to the environment. And that is priceless. So I keep asking everyone, what price would you like to put on value? I mean, to me, as a person who worked in the fashion business, who, by the way, my job was to entice people to buy more and more. Today, I do tell them, we do need to buy, but we need to buy less, but we need to buy things of value. So let's not sponge off the environment because we're saving a few bucks in the name of thrifty pricing, in the name of cheap and cheerful. Yeah, I, I, I really believe that if I, if there's a big difference in the way we can change our personal narrative, our language. When I say I'm buying a product of value, it is very different when I'm saying I'm buying something that costs less and hence affordable. And I think that is the way of thinking that makes us go into a loop where we don't hold up a mirror to our own ideologies, to our own purchasing power, to our own responsibility, our personal responsibility. So we have a choice, you know, as Ashish said, do you want to be a conspicuous consumer or do you want to be a conscious consumer? And I think the decision is for you and me to make whether you are a manufacturer, producer, creator, designer, it doesn't matter. We are all consumers by the end of the day. So what kind of a consumer do you want to be? And I love this, this quote that I actually put on my Instagram today, which says, what is a cynic? And this is by Oscar Wilde. Says, what is a cynic? A man who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. So I think um, I focus on personal responsibility and ideology and old wisdom that come from different cultures to teach ourselves that we need to make inner changes before we affect outer good. Great point, Ramak uh, Bandana. Thank you so much for that. And, um, and I think there's so many different lenses on this whole um, shift that needs to come in on the, on the aspects of economics, on the fact that and there's also a growing narrative that um, as an industry or as an ecosystem, and in fact, any industry for that matter, which is aspiring to become a circular economy, that a true circular economy cannot be achieved unless we really uh, address the issue of true pricing, right? And we also know how this whole mindset around the economics of cost and pricing has impacted everything that a business does, right? Or in the way we do business as organizations across the value chain, uh, the way we, the relationships that we strike with the uh, upstream and downstream supply chain partners, the relationships that we build with our consumers, as you were alluding to, the relationship that we build with the workers who are formally or informally part of our uh, value chain as well. So uh, thank you so much for that uh, reminder. And uh, Janvi, I want to kind of circle back to you now, uh, just coming in from the lens of a capital provider. Now, um, as an impact investor, of course, one of the key values that uh, you're driving or the organization is driving is how do we embrace risk to create meaningful impact, right? And that's been a defining characteristic of um, how Avishkar has been approaching uh, impact investment for that matter. Um, what I would love for the audience is to learn from your experience and from Avishkar's experience as well as that for these entrepreneurs, for these innovators, or in fact, even mainstream brands and uh, manufacturers or organizations which are taking on the ambition to solve some of the gnarliest problems that the world has thrown at us. Um, what could be some ways in which they could realign their values, the way they do business, the way they approach business, the way they build business models that could make them attractive to the providers of capital, impact, catalytic, any forms of capital. Because um, as we were talking a little earlier in the uh, previous segment was that no matter where you are in the value chain and no matter how big or small you are, every organization needs access to capital, right? Because the efforts towards circular economy is truly transitional and transformational. And every organization or individual will need access to that capital to help them go through that uh, or help them in their uh, cost of transition or the transition cost for that matter. So would love to hear from you on how entrepreneurs or impact entrepreneurs or innovators are approaching this whole aspect of how they can make themselves attractive to the providers of capital. Thank God. Um, so uh, some of the areas that I'd like, like touch upon are, um, you know, revolving around the premise that 
lot of these entrepreneurs are solving uh, the problems uh, socially, environmentally, uh, and trying to unlock uh, you know the economic potential while they solve for these problems. And that's how impact investments are made, and you know how um, such social enterprises are generated. Um, but often, uh, while solving for these problems, uh, uh, one has to create either demand for the product or service, or one has to create supply. And in certain cases, uh, you know, uh, one may have to create both demand and supply, uh, which which ends up becoming the most challenging uh, way of conducting a business. And um, just to share a small example, I mean, if you're riding a tailwind in the behavior of consumers or a shift in businesses uh, to solve for the demand or supply gap, I think it's quite fair. But if you're trying to go against it to build your business model, uh, that would make it extremely challenging. But in either of the two cases, uh, it's very important to ensure that uh, the supply and demand dynamics are well captured by the business model to uh, make it highly scalable by using technology. And that is quite imperative in these days. Uh, and it must encompass uh, all the legs of your business model, including sourcing, processing, uh, marketing, sales, distribution. Uh, so for instance, when these stakeholders are onboarded on the business, uh, it's important to uh, onboard them through digitalization. We've seen models scale rapidly doing this. And uh, for an impact investor, for any investor for that matter, this is not just an aspiration, but it is a requirement. And as we speak, we're seeing uh, innovation across all these areas, right? Uh, be it automation for processing, uh, marketing of products through social media, using tech-enabled uh, lean distribution channels, uh, developing direct-to-consumer uh, sales channels, and so on. And uh, startups must think about it right from day one, uh, and uh, not once they've you know, moved on in their uh, business model, and it's too, too late probably to you know, make that change. Um, another area that uh, I'd like to touch upon is uh, that of uh, uh, building teams and uh, talent. Um, um, now, it's, it's important to have co-founders who not only share your vision and passion, uh, but also bring in core complementary skill sets. And uh, 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 one may not realize this fully uh, at the beginning and the initial days, but uh, as you scale the business, uh, designing the organization structure and building out teams become more and more complex, uh, which uh, founders must start thinking about right from the word go. And uh, lastly, and most importantly, uh, if you're a consumer facing brand, please do not overlook the importance of building an aspirational and uh, attractive product or experience for your customer just because you're sustainable in nature. Um, unfortunately, we believe that only a fraction of the market would buy your product or service uh, because of sustainability or your positioning of being sustainable at the back end. Uh, but if you want to build a very large business, uh, you have to reach the masses and you have to satisfy the needs and demands of your target customer. It's only then that you'll be able to make a dent in um, the large complex problem that you stand to solve for. I can run through examples if uh, time permits. Uh, so we've made several investments in this space. Uh, some of the prominent ones, uh, I'll be happy to discuss, Venkat, if we have some time. Um, so one of the businesses that we've invested in, and uh, I'd like to call out here is Jaipur. Uh, and Ashish is very well aware of it. It's an ethnic apparel brand. Avishkar had invested in at a very early stage, uh, which we exited to Aditya Birla Fashion Retail a few years back. So while riding on the e-commerce wave and uh, plugging the gap for um, high quality ethnic brands in the, um, in the upmarket uh, you know, uh, modern Indian women's aspiration, uh, Jaipur built a strong inclusive uh, supply chain at the back end where uh, skilled artisans uh, creating ha um, handcrafted apparel in authentic art forms across the country got a chance to participate in uh, the growing India's consumption story and earn better realizations through this direct sales channel. But an important point to note here is uh, that the company's commercial intent of being close to the artisans was to provide the company with strong control over the supply chain and quality and authenticity of the products, which made, which made it a scalable business and a strong and sustainable business. And another example that I'd like to call out is uh, that of Soulful. 
uh, and it's much closer to my heart given that it's a company that I had managed personally. A um, lot of us are now aware of uh, millets and how good are they from, um, from a health perspective. Uh, but they're also very, very good for the farmer from the economics of producing them. And uh, also very environmental friendly because they require just a fraction of water that is required you know, to grow an equivalent amount of patty. And um, they don't need fertilizers, pesticides, they need very little irrigation. Uh, and that's it's time to solve for the problems of water scarcity, environmental pollution, and they're solving for you know, the need to conserve our natural aquifers and the carbon sinks. So investing in a food brand uh, that centers around millets uh, helps uh, by transforming millets into you know, products that are tasty, healthy, convenient, and aspirational as a product. You're generating demand for these crops at the back end, which farmers are now willing to produce more because there is more demand for it at the front end not just by one company like Soulful, but several other brands who are riding on the wave of healthy consumption uh, by consuming millets. So, uh, you know, had, had Jaipur and Soulful not built, you know, aspirational, um, trendy products uh, at the front end, uh, building a scalable and sustainable model at the back end would not have been possible. Lovely. Thank you so much, Janvi. And uh, I think with the example of uh, the unique perspective on uh, Jaipur, uh, which is, of course, now part of the board, two portfolios uh, here. Um, uh, Ashish, if I could come back to you now, and I, I think one of the things that we've always loved in our conversations with you and Naresh is the emphasis that you've always put on how even to build a sustainable business starts with collaborating with our supply chain partners, both upstream and downstream partners. Um, what we would love for the audience to learn from you and get some insights from you on what are some of the ways in which we can actually go ahead and start building those relationships and reimagine those relationships across the supply chain that will probably help us along the uh, journey towards sustainability. Uh, so Venkat, let me start uh, with, with the context of the industry. Uh, it is, I think, widely known that over a long period of time, the back end, which is sourcing and supply chain of, of textile industry, not in India, but globally, uh, tended to move to the cheapest source. So people went from Europe to, to China, when China became expensive, went to Bangladesh and went to Vietnam, it keeps going down and down. And you often wonder, therefore, what is it that's driving the whole, whole behavior of driving the only, seems like the only competitive advantage that businesses can build uh, in, in, in a world where, you know, fashion can be very distinctive and yet at the same time, uh, if there is every bit of fashion is distinctive, then it's so similar. Uh, if cost and therefore cost efficiencies were the only pieces of competitive dis dis advantages, then what you do, you kept pushing your uh, the rest of the upstream value chain down and down, uh, keep cutting costs, keep cutting prices and so on and so forth. The balances that businesses need to build in making sure that, and especially in context of India, you know, we are, we are uh, the Indian apparel industry is five and a half lakh crore. We are one of the largest player with 10,000 crores. Uh, if large players are so small and so insignificant, you know how much more is the runway available. But if you were to build large businesses and these were to sort of multifold grow, you need to have an ecosystem of suppliers which are sustainable, who reinvest in themselves, who actually get value. I mean, I think uh, Janvi talked about in consumer sense how brands must create aspiration for consumers to be able to pay that value. And, and Badna had an even more interesting take about uh, the difference between value and price and cost. I think essentially, if you want a sustainable ecosystem, it first, it needs to be obviously the eventually it needs to be paid by consumer. And one of the roles that brands have is to constantly educate consumers about what are they paying for? What is the underlying element of that value? And uh, we have always believed that if you are able to educate and make that journey, a part of that will get passed on to the rest of the value chain. 
So we start with simple things. We start with the things like compliance, things like human rights, things like basic, uh, uh, you know, stuff that part of a value chain must mandatorily do, which encourages more and more people to fall into the net. Because if large players insist that their value chain is uh, not just compliant, but uh, moving forward in terms of their own uh, standards of how they're running their operation, uh, that, that's a positive progression for the industry as a whole. And that's something that has allowed us to grow because our partners have grown with us. Our value chain partners invest. Uh, at times, it increases their cost. At times, it increases our cost. And at times, a part of it is transferable to consumers. Sometimes it is not. But I think it's a journey. Very Too often okay. in our, uh, in, in, as a brand, too often we have wondered uh, the Thank you, Ghani. I was in my office conference. Sorry, there seems to be a... Sorry. Um, hi, Katie. Uh, could I request you to go on mute, please? Sorry about that, Ashish. Yeah. So, Sorry. Uh, far too often, uh, brands have this dilemma on, on if I go down all the way and buy, buy the most sustainable cotton with best practices and go through the entire processing and so on and so forth, my cost goes up so much, is consumer willing to pay for it? And uh, this is a battle which, uh, which often holds you from moving forward. And it's a real dilemma for, for businesses. Uh, what I have seen over a period of time that brands cannot just sit back and wait for consumers to move. They have a role in educating, they have a role in, in bringing out those values, they have a role in talking about it. And eventually consumers pay for what they think is important, what goes inside. But uh, two things brands need to do. One is obviously be able to credibly communicate the value and under underlying cost and therefore price that, that consumers are paying for. Second, in a world of claims, counterclaims uh, and hyperlatives all the time, how do you build authenticity and credibility so that consumers don't get confused and by some manner discount everything that goes around. Because that's the other challenge that, that's a problem that brands themselves bring upon uh, by, by, by not creating that credibility. So it's a journey, uh, a part of that journey. So uh, as, as, as particularly as brands and retailers, we believe our responsibility is to expand both ends of the spectrum. To get consumers to see real value for good things, so to say, that you do. Uh, be responsible, uh, be uh, compliant, ensure and encourage responsibility and compliance in the rest of the value chain, and therefore be able to pay for it. And on the other side of the value chain, encourage your uh, suppliers, encourage the, the other part of the value chain to come onto this because you show them a path that it pays eventually. I think the economics of sustainability, the whole cycle of business will only move if uh, influential people, uh, these could be, I think Banda is, uh, is, is, is uh, probably downplaying her role, but these could be thought leaders, journalists, uh, these could be brands themselves. But I think that's the journey that we need to go, go down on which will allow a more sustainable ecosystem to evolve because consumers will truly appreciate the value and be willing to pay for it. And, in, and suppliers on the other side will actually be making those investments, which uh, uh, eventually uh, moves the whole ecosystem into a more sustainable space. That's been a philosophy, it's a journey. I don't think uh, it's possible to achieve in a very short run, but, but we are deeply committed to that. Perfect. Thank you so much, Ashish. Uh, that was very insightful. Um, um, and uh, folks, uh, before we come to Bandana for her closing remarks, uh, just a quick reminder that we've got three sessions lined up, each touching upon the three dimensions of the sustainable business, the social, the business case of it, but more importantly, <clears throat> the uh, environmental impact that sustainable businesses can make. So watch out for the session on getting to net zero and the role the private sector can play in getting to net zero emissions. Uh, it will be tagged under climate change and energy, so do look out. Uh, but Bandana, of course, I uh, would love to come back because I think uh, Ashish made a very uh, crucial point about, uh, you know, the, the change can't really happen unless we are authentic and we build credibility in what we do. 
and that's a relation that's something that is really required at a foundational level to build that relationship uh, that can be endured with the end consumer and it almost sounds like an ideological shift that needs to happen from brands uh, when we draw this relationship or imagine this relationship with our supply chain partners or both upstream and downstream partners now i want to come back to you and take us um, all the way home to wrap up the session but one of the things that we've always been speaking about is, um, of course, the need for a shift that is perhaps an ideological one. And one of the things that you've often been quoted at several forums is on how we can marry Gandhian principles uh, into sustainable fashion. So uh, over to you, Bandana, and would love to hear what are those ideological shifts and what is that, uh, how do we marry Gandhian philosophy into sustainable fashion? Well, thank you so much. And again, I'm just like cracking up because everyone's talking about such big companies and such powerful jobs and so much impact and change and policy. And, and I'm sitting in Bali doing my research on like, you know, economists and uh, humanitarians like Schumacher and Gandhi, who, by the way, they were all influenced by Gandhi influenced EF Schumacher, who is a globally uh, recognized um, economist. And, um, while we are talking about big things, please don't misunderstand. I think we do need the business. We need all these millions to be employed. But I think it's the quality of the business that I'm talking about. How do we do this business in a humanitarian way? And so I keep going back to E.F. Schumacher, the economist who was influenced by Mahatma Gandhi. And he wrote a book called Small is Beautiful. And within that, there is a chapter called The Buddhist Economy, uh, Buddhist Economies. And where he talks about, is there a need while living in a material world to, to be non-materialistic in the way that we do want to buy the good things in this world, but that we're not driven by greed and want for more and more that is going to degrade our people and our environment where labor becomes the, the object of overconsumption and overproduction. So labor should actually be an end in itself the act of doing something is very humanizing, that we are all contributing to a common good for social impact, for community building, it's service. So that should be an end in itself. But when labor is taken as a means, just as nature is taken as the means, just as an environment, everything can be pillaged in the name of materialism and consumerism. That's why I keep going back to the idea of small is beautiful which is the title of E.F. Schumacher's, um, uh, uh, this wonderful book that he wrote with this incredible chapter that everyone should read called The Buddhist Economy. Very secular, it's not religious, but just the idea that your ideology, like what I talk about, I don't even say it's a job anymore. It's my dharma. It's my dharma to be able to say my truth to however little number of people I can reach, but it's my dharma. And perhaps that will define my karma, but in a very egalitarian, secular way, non-religious way, I am a believer in cause and effect. So I've gone from working in Vogue, which believed only on products, but not just Vogue, in the fashion industry, which is so high flying and gorgeous and beautiful and so enticing. So we only believe in the product and the product, but the deeper you dive with your own intentions, then I realize that, that the process is there too. There's a, something to be said about the process. Then you, know, you dive into the process, then you understand that there are people behind it. They're real human beings. As you said, and you guys have been talking about, they're real human beings who are affected. And then now, uh, you know, when I moved to Bali and decided that I'm going to become an activist, then purpose was everything. So there's the product, there's the process, there's the people and purpose. And now with this philosophy and ideology, my Vedic um, research that I do, now it's presence. Can we do business with presence? Can we make presence more impactful than product? That says a lot, this is an ideology. I'm not creating any factory. I don't have any product to sell, but just that mind shift. So you talk about the mind shift and Gandhi was the one who engineered it in my head because for him, a good business person, a good human being was the one who believed in ahimsa, nonviolence, because nonviolence, as he said, his words, is not a garment that you put on and off at will. It has, nonviolence has to sit in your heart. 
and it must be an inseparable part of your entire being. And with that, um, as I would say in Sanskrit, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, the earth Perfect. is your family. Lovely. Bandana, thank you so much for that lovely uh, perspective. And uh, I'm sure uh, the Gandhian philosophies and the principles that you were referring to also say that every voice counts. So please don't put it down. Uh, and I think each one of us, and that holds true for each one of us, right? Um, we, we all play a role that's important for this ecosystem that we've been talking about uh, for the last hour and a half now. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Ashish, Janvi, and Bandana. Thank you so much for your time. Such a pleasure to have you. I wish we could have a longer conversation, but I'm sure we'll find another uh, opportunity to connect with each one of you uh, separately. But thank you so much for making the time. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very you. much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Um, all right, uh, folks, that brings us to the end of the opening plenary, um, the kickoff of the third edition of the CF Conclave. Um, as you can see your chat boxes, we've got three fantastic sessions lined up, each looking at the uh, specific dimension of sustainable business. Do look out for them. We've got a fabulous lineup of speakers and organizations, practitioners from the front lines of shaping the narrative and building a body of work and evidence around how sustainability is not just a pipe dream or even circularity is not just a pipe dream, um, but can be done and can be done together. So the only thing that I would leave you with is that we focus on what we can do. We focus on our circle of influence, no matter what we do and what role we play across the value chain. But it's important for us to know that our individual responsibility is the one that helps and shape the collective response ability for us to deal with the problems that we are facing. Uh, thank you so much for your time again and uh, delighted to be um, hosting the third CF conclave for each one of you. And we look forward to seeing you at the other sessions. Thank you and have a great day ahead.